Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another session at Room for Discussion. Uh, today we have the renowned uh, Professor uh, Hyun Chung uh, of Cambridge University. As many of you probably know, he is a critic of contemporary capitalism, and he's written a lot of widely acclaimed books, such as Economics, uh, A User's Guide, and Kicking Away the Ladder. Not only, yeah, not only is he a critic of contemporary globalization and capitalism, but he's also a critic of the way economics is taught to you. Tomorrow he will have, uh, he will go to Utrecht for the event uh, Rethinking Economics. And if you have tickets, I heard they already uh, run out. But if you have tickets, well, enjoy. It's going to be really interesting for anyone interested in economics and uh, and uh, education. Uh, our topic of discussion today is a phenomenon which interests us all: uh, globalization. Uh, globalization is the story of our times. It's what, it's what connects us to millions across the world. Milton Friedman conceptualized this reality using the imagery of a single lead pencil, how it is built as it travels across the world, and when it finally is finished and lands in your pocket, ready to be used. We now know, however, that this uh, romanticized tale of contemporary uh, globalization is a far cry from the kind of hyper-globalization we are witnessing today. Indeed, as Ra Danny Roderick, uh, the economist from Harvard, claimed, uh, the, the lesson from history is that continued globalization cannot be taken for granted. For this same reason is that we must re-examine and rethink globalization. As it is tradition here in Room for Discussion, you, the audience, will have the opportunity to ask your own questions. So when the time comes, uh, raise your hand, and Sarah, with the microphone there, will go and assist you. So let's just give a warm round of applause to Mr. Ha uh, Professor Ha Yong Chang. Hello. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Chang, once again, thank you for being here with no, us. No, it's my pleasure. Uh, you're currently a reader at the University mm -hmm. of Cambridge, but you're originally from uh, South Korea. That's right. Uh, and you were born in what you've called the golden era of capitalism. Mm -hmm. What exactly do you remember of this great period? Well, the my earlier memory is uh, very much confined to South Korea because uh, it was a very poor country and the government basically banned foreign travel to save uh, foreign exchanges. Mm? So the view of the government at the time was that, that uh, you know, Dedicated. if we own foreign exchanges uh, through export, we have to use it uh, to build factories, you know, so that uh, feed people, you know. You cannot uh, let people go and sh uh, that buy luxury mm -hmm. things in Paris or New York. So, yeah, I never traveled abroad until I was uh, 23 which is when I went to Cambridge, England to be a graduate student. And yeah, the interesting that, that uh, anecdote is that uh, this was a time when South Korean planes uh, couldn't fly over China or Soviet Union. So we first had to fly to Anchorage in Alaska, nine hours, refuel for two hours, fly down to Europe another nine hours, and then there wasn't even direct flight to London, so I had to wait that three hours in Paris but for the connecting flight. So it took me 23 hours to get there. Now, <laughs> <laughs> so the, my my memories are very much confined to that of South Korea. But the, you know, the, the I lived through the so-called economic miracle. Yeah? This was a time when the economy was growing at eight, 10, 12 percent every year. I mean, what is happening in say countries like China today? Yeah, and uh, it is a kind of economic growth that you could almost see with your eyes, you know. Mm -hmm. Like on a, on a personal experience, for example, in the family, do you, do you see incomes rise? Do you actually see your own living family? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, uh, you know, living through it, you don't quite realize the significance of it because you see it, I mean, around you, so you assume that it is natural that people's living standards uh, grow like that every year. But, but then yeah, later when I that, uh, came out of Korea, I realized that this was something extraordinary. And how would you say your life was different uh, from that of uh, other uh, kids growing in one of the uh, Southeast uh, Asian tigers, so-called, those countries that experience, experience rapid industrialization and growth? Uh, do you think they experience the same, the same thing you mentioned, they seen with their own eyes? 
they live in San Yes, uh, but I think uh, that, you know, Koreans are much more hot-blooded than other people. So we had a lot of social conflict, yeah? you know, demonstration, riots, yeah? strikes every day. So, you know, growing up there, even while you realize that uh, this, I mean, the, the economic growth is uh, bringing benefit to uh, people in general, I mean, there were a lot of conflicts, yeah? and you couldn't uh, just uh, ignore it. Yeah? And was there a period where you realized this kind of golden age of capitalism was over, a kind of time of disillusionment for you? Uh, well, I mean, I didn't experience it uh, in Korea because uh, Korea kept uh, growing at uh, the miracle rate of growth until the late 80s, early 90s. But uh, yeah, when I came to England to study in 1986, this was uh, at the height of uh, the Thatcherite revolution so there was a massive uh, deindustrialization of uh, the traditional Great industrial Britain. north yeah and yeah i mean that there was a huge uh, that uh, kind of debate on where the country should go uh, because uh, that chance on said well what happened in the 60s and 70s was a disaster too much government intervention i mean that too close that we have to open up, deregulate, and then, yeah, I mean, the significant uh, section of uh, British uh, society said, no, that's uh, not uh, what we want, you know? I mean, because uh, in areas like uh, Manchester and Leeds and Bradford, I mean, the factories are closing, closing down the center left and right, and mm -hmm. I mean, millions of people are unemployed, and yeah, so, I mean, the I saw the end of, yeah. you know, golden age in Britain. You know? And, um, Today we want to talk about globalization, but globalization is often um, linked in people's minds to neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that is, and how would you define neoliberalism yourself? Yeah, I mean, th that's uh, not necessarily the right way to see it, although that is how it is uh, mostly seen. First of all, let's not forget that globalization has been going on for the last 500 years. Eh? Yeah. And of course, uh, in the earlier period, uh, a lot of it was just that uh, barbaric, you know. I mean, the colonization, you know, that uh, opening a country with a uh, gunboat and uh, putting them mm -hmm. under unequal treaties, you know. I mean, the genocide, you know. But, uh, the, you know, this uh, globalization has been going on for the last five decades. I mean, of course, uh, with ups and downs. But you would say there was a spike, especially in the 80s, right, with the Thatcherite movement. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, the, 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 I mean, that there's a big increase in globalization in the, uh, sorry, after the 80s. So that's why people associated with uh, neoliberalism. neoliberalism. But actually, there was a... Uh, prior experience uh, which was very similar to what we experienced uh, since 1980s. Because that uh, between, say, 1970 and 1914, the world was actually, in some way, even more globalized than it was today. Huh? I mean, it depends on which indicator you look at. But mm -hmm. so that, that, that was uh, the earlier uh, sort of golden age of globalization, if you like. And then that ended with the First World War, the Great Depression, the Second World War, and after the Second World War, a lot of countries were cautious about this uh, the excessive openness, so they had a lot of control. Yeah? And contrary to what the, the today's uh, neoliberals uh, would uh, the, the want you to think, I mean, that was actually the best period when capitalism performed the best ever, you know? Yeah, this is the golden age. That's right, the period between 19. 50 but and 1975. How would yeah? you then define neoliberalism, those ideas that became really famous in the 80s? Yeah. Well, w why is it neo? Because uh, there was an early neoliberalism. Of course, uh, it uh, gets a bit confusing because uh, Americans, uh, uh, instead of saying social democratic, they say liberal. Yeah? <laughs> so Ted Kennedy is a uh, liberal. Yeah? I mean, if he came to the Netherlands or the, the, yeah. the Germany, he would be a social democrat. Yeah? So the people often uh, get confused, but uh, in the standard European terms, liberals are people who want small government, yeah? mm -hmm. people who want uh, open economy. Yeah? So the Free markets, open economy. Exactly. So this uh, so-called neoliberalism is a successor of the earlier liberalism that created the first mm -hmm. hyper-globalization in the late 19th and early 20th century. But why is it neo? Because that, 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 that the neoliberals uh, accept 
slightly bigger role of the government than the 19th century liberals. First of all, they accept the central bank. Yeah, actually, the neoliberals uh, that have uh, that, uh, blind faith in the, the wisdom of the central bank, but in the 19th century, liberals were generally against the central bank. Yeah? Mm -hmm. They didn't want monopoly. Yeah? So the, they argued, why should the government have a monopoly in the issuing money? Yeah? Secondly, the neoliberals uh, are in favor of intellectual property. 19th century liberals uh, that, that were against it. Actually, this country used to uh, the, refuse to protect patents. Huh? Mm -hmm. No, because that, that this country was that, that the old, uh, well, I mean, that, that story before the 19th century is a bit different, but uh, you know, in the 19th century, this was uh, literally the most uh, liberal economy in the world. Huh? And they were actually consistent. They said, you know, we don't want the uh, monopoly. We don't want the, the, you know, the artificial protection. So if you have a uh, protection, we should have protection everywhere. Why should you protect ideas? Eh? I see. So actually, the, until 1912, this country refused to protect uh, patterns, which of course meant that uh, Phillips uh, that, uh, started by you know, that, uh, making light bulbs uh, whose technologies are entirely patented by Thomas Edison and his company, G General Electric. So you know, by today's standard, uh, this would have been uh, unacceptable, but you know, uh, so there are these uh, differences, but uh, the general philosophy is the same. You know? I mean, the, the economy is driven by uh, selfish, rational individuals. You know, the government uh, should uh, provide law and order and protect uh, the property, but uh, do little more than that, yeah? and have open border, maximum competition. Another definition of neoliberalism mm -hmm. uh, comes from the French philosopher Foucault, who describes neoliberalism. Foucault. Ah, Foucault, yeah. Who describes neoliberalism as the application of the economic rationale, the, the rationale of markets, mm -hmm. to the social part of our lives. So it's more than just policies, as you mentioned. It has more of a normative stance That's in our right, daily yeah. lives. Uh, what do you think of this definition? No, no, I mean, I think it's a very good definition because, uh, you know, economists that, uh, that uh, I mean, free market economists that usually try to tell you that uh, economics is a science and that uh, it's value free. Mm -hmm. But it's got huge uh, the ethical as assumptions uh, behind it. And yeah, I mean, the, the assumption is that, 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 that you know, the best that, that, that thing to, uh, sorry, best principle according to which uh, you run the economy is uh, greed of individuals, yeah? unrestrained. On top of that, other areas of uh, human life uh, that can be, and uh, indeed that uh, in many cases that should be, also governed by economic logic. Yeah? But then, uh, would countries that, for example, are not considered necessarily neoliberal, countries that do not follow the classic prescriptions of neoliberal policies, for example, uh, floating exchange rates, might still be considered neoliberal because they have, for example, a, I would say a government that acts like another profit-seeking, mm -hmm. profit-maximizing agent. Yeah. So no, it's a, a spectrum. Yeah? Yeah. So, you know, yeah, at one extreme, you would have, I mean, say, in the rich world, uh, because uh, it's uh, difficult to compare developing countries with uh, rich countries. In the, the rich world, at the one extreme, you have the United States. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And at the other extreme, you probably have uh, the, the Finland. Yeah? But in between, I mean, the, for example, you know, education here is uh, socialized. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, you don't, I mean, you pay a little bit, but uh, you don't pay to get university education. Yeah? If you live in America, you have to pay a huge amount of money. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If you live in South Korea, you pay a lot, although not as much as in America, yeah? and so on. So it's a uh, metro uh, gradation. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so in general, I mean, that some countries allow more areas uh, of life uh, to be affected by market principles. So in America, that uh, education, health, I mean, these are all market ties. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And that, that, that even in the same area, some countries might that, that have more market pressure than others. So for example, in Britain, even though they have, uh, well, this that, that socialized healthcare called the National Health Service, mm -hmm. it's uh, become a lot more marketized uh, since the 1980s. So it's uh, still a public program, but a lot of it is that, that, that subject to market-like competition. You know, a lot of uh, the supplies come from the private sector, which are that, that allowed to that, that make a profit. So yeah, even in the same area, even if it's uh, you know broadly socialized, uh, you can introduce uh, more market principles. And yeah, certainly in the, since the 1980s, many countries have uh, so seen. This has been happening. Yeah. yeah. 
this kind of thing. But would you say that there is also a kind of moral um, aspect to uh, new neoliberalism in that um, the kind of corporate work ethic uh, ethos behind it, which drives it? Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, the work ethic, you know, the people often think that uh, people are poor because they don't work hard, but actually the poor people work uh, harder. Yeah? No, seriously, I mean, this country is uh, one of the laziest countries in the world. Yeah? <laughs> no, sadly, you lost the title to the, to the Germans. Yeah? Because uh, until like three years ago, you used to have the shortest working hour in the world. Yeah? And the Greeks, uh, who are supposed to be in the, the financial trouble because they don't work hard, actually, they work 40% longer than you do. Yeah? You know, that uh, you go to America, that, 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 that they complain so much about lazy Mexicans, but did you know that Mexicans are work 25% longer than the Americans? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, work ethic is a, a very debatable concept, but yes, I mean, the, the, the corporate logic is uh, permeating mm -hmm. increasingly large number of areas, but, you know, the, what we have to realize is that this is not inevitable. It's not, you know, necessity, it's a choice, yeah? No, because that uh, when you think about it, I mean, in the, the, the 19th century, you know, you could uh, buy and sell a lot of things uh, that you cannot e imagine buying and selling. Yeah? Human beings, I mean, there was slavery. Yeah? I mean, you could buy children's labor. There was the child labor. Yeah? But at the same time, we're also making our lives more uh, to the, well, leaving it to the market, as you say, with healthcare, for example. Yeah, exactly. Especially so after the 90s. That's right. So that uh, we... Uh, from the 19th century until the 1980s, we reduced the, the, the domain of market by nationalizing health service, you know, the, the socializing education and so on. But then since then, the, we are going, the, uh, going in the other direction the, again. Yeah? Okay, so you've been, as I think it's quite clear, a, a prominent critic of contemporary globalization and, uh, and its respective institutions. Uh, you're, for example, quite beloved for this exact same reason by uh, leaders of emerging countries. For example, uh, the ex-president of Ecuador, uh, Rafael Correa, mm -hmm. he finds you as an inspiration. Which of your ideas do you think inspire Correa or leaders like Correa the most that, that you've proposed? Well, you know, the, the central idea of mine, I mean, well, it's not even my idea, you know, other people have uh, talked about it, you know, the guy who invented it is uh, the first American Treasury Secretary, the, the Alexander Hamilton, that's the guy you see on the $10 bill, yeah? <laughs> infant industry. Yeah, the infant industry argument that, you know, the countries uh, who are backward economically today, if they want to catch up with the economically more advanced nations, need to protect and nurture their young industries. And, you know, that uh, has been actually behind almost every economic success story in the last 200 years. Yeah? Britain used it to catch up with the Netherlands. South Korea. Yeah, South Korea used it to catch up with the Japanese and the Americans. Yeah? The Americans uh, used it to catch up with the British. But I think uh, what uh, uh, makes uh, the developing country the leaders uh, interested in my idea is uh, that you know I try to tell them that actually you know your current state of affairs is uh, not a destiny you can change it and yeah in that uh, the my own country South Korea is uh, quite uh, the, uh, interesting because you know the today is uh, the, the sixth uh, largest uh, producer of motor cars in the world yeah in 1965 I was born in 1963 so that when I was at uh, two years old the total automobile production of the country was 100, mm. not 100,000, 100, yeah? <laughs> In that same year, the Americans uh, produced 8 million cars, yeah? 4 million by General Motors alone, yeah? Yeah, so if uh, that, uh, someone told you in 1965 that uh, there's this uh, that, uh, very poor country uh, called South Korea with uh, income lower than that of Ghana, which produces 100 cars uh, today, will you know, beat the Americans in the automobile market uh, that 55 years later, you would have laughed. Yeah? But wouldn't you say that there's many factors that affect uh, the success of infant industry promotion? Of For course, example, yeah. Douglas uh, Irwin, the economist, argues that the infant industry uh, policies that uh, the U.S. Uh, did were inefficient. And mm -hmm. this is something that 
some might even argue happening in Latin American countries due to rent-seeking rent behavior and, and other type of uh, deficiencies. Th if that's the case, if these deficiencies exist, mm -hmm. what is then the key for the infant industry promotion uh, yeah. policy to work? No, first of all, that, that you have to understand that this is a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So if okay. at, uh, you want to get a good job, you have to go to school, you have to get educated, you have to get uh, certificates. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact that you go to school doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to succeed. Yeah? So that's the first point. And yeah, I mean, that, uh, you know, I mean, th there are many conditions that uh, you have to meet, but uh, basically what uh, the made it different in Korea from what uh, the was it that uh, what it was in the Latin America, for example, was that the Koreans made it sure that they invest in increasing their capabilities. Yeah? So you start with the lowest things, you know, I mean, the, one of the biggest exports in South Korea in the uh, mid-1960s was uh, wigs made with human hair. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah apparently, that, that, that I don't know about today, in those days, you apparently had to plant each strand of hair hair onto whatever you put on your head when you're wearing a wig. So it could be done only in the cheapest that, uh, wage countries, and South Korea was one of them. Yeah? But they protected this industry. Well, I mean, th that industry really didn't need protection because, no. yeah, th no one was going to do it in America. Yeah? <laughs> but with the money that you earn, you invest in, say, electronics. Yeah? And then that has to be protected mm -hmm. because otherwise uh, it will be wiped out uh, by, by foreign competition. Yeah? So it, uh, you have to go through this. The contrast with, well, you know, I haven't got the time to explain it that, that, that in detail, so let's that, that, that be kind of uh, a bit that, that, uh, kind of exaggerating. You know, in the 1950s, that, that Neither Korea, no Brazil, no India could make nice cars. Yeah? The Brazilian approach was, we cannot make nice cars, but we want nice cars. Yeah? So we're go going to ask foreigners to come and build them for us. Yeah? So they invited Renault, they invited Fiat, they invited Ford. They built the cars, you know, sold them in the, the Brazilian market, but there was no ambition that this industry will one day compete with American or yeah, the German the automobile industry. Yeah? Mm -hmm. There was no investment to develop your own technology to build your own car. The Indian approach was we cannot build nice cars, but then we don't want nice cars yeah? because nice cars are imperialist conspiracy. Yeah? <laughs> so they kept uh, reproducing these 1950s British <laughs> cars for the next 30 years, and by the late 1980s, Indian ambassador cars became an international joke. Yeah? The Korean approach was, well, we cannot build nice cars, so we are going to drive around shit cars until we can build <laughs> nice ones. Yeah? yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, Because uh, until like uh, late 1980s, import of uh, foreign cars was completely banned. Yeah? Yeah, so the Korean cars sucked. Yeah. But, but then that they kept investing in making cars better. So by the late 1980s, they were actually able to export their cars. Yeah. And then later they opened up. So this is how you have to do it. Yeah. But you mentioned something interesting, how some countries were unwilling to develop their own technology. Uh -huh. Would you say then, uh, for example, uh, I think it's economist Asher Mozu, the Turkish economist uh, from MIT, he argues that countries should remain open to technology and inno innovation from outside because countries that have not done that historically mm -hmm. lead to, well, drastic, horrible circumstances in the future. Should countries, how should countries then, while protecting industries in which they, wanna they want to develop, uh, for example, South Korea with mm -hmm. cars, how can they protect those industries while still being open to the technology and innovation from outside? Yeah, no, no, that, uh, you know, that, I think uh, that people like Asimoglu, that they exaggerate uh, that their argument because, you know, the choice is not between, say, Hong Kong and North Korea. Yeah? There's a huge range of things you can do. Yeah, yeah so of course, uh, South Koreans that, uh, were very eager to uh, get uh, foreign technologies. Yeah? 
I mean, you are a very poor country. I mean, that uh, no one's going to that, uh, use your technologies, and you don't have the capabilities to develop them. So you have to import these uh, technologies first, but then it, uh, you have to make them your own. You have to learn how to improve these technologies. You have to learn one day how to, how to innovate. Use it properly yeah? as well. In order to do that, you need uh, a degree of protection, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because that, I mean, once again, we go back to, say, examples of uh, the, the students, yeah? So in the beginning, when you are in primary school, you know, you have to memorize a lot of things, you know, times table, you know, the, okay, they teach you some logic, but, you know, you basically have to absorb a lot of things and take them as given. As you grow a bit older, you need to think for yourself, yeah? Mm -hmm. When you go to university, you want to be critical of uh, the existing argument, yeah? So that's how it should work, yeah? So this means that uh, you are not refusing to absorb other people's technologies, yeah? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you uh, just keep repeating other people, then you will never that, that become original, yeah? So that's the difficult balance to strike, yeah? Yeah, but do you believe certain countries are, especially developing countries, are kind of coerced into joining this global economy, not only by other countries, but also by the institutions of globalization, such as the IMF, the World Bank, WTO? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, uh, you know, the or I would where say coerced. that... Hmm? Or where coerced in the past? For yeah, yeah, yeah. Ecuador. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the, there is a lot of coercion, but also the, let's not forget that some of the local elite uh, want this, yeah? Mm -hmm. No, because that uh, if you, I don't know, that own a lot of land or copper mine in a developing country, mm -hmm. why do you want to industrialize? Yeah? Mm -hmm. You are that, that earning a lot of money. You know, that, that, that with that, that you can import uh, nice things from France and that, uh, America. You know, this is that, uh, how American landlords exactly thought in the 19th century. The mm -hmm. American South was actually in favor of free trade. Mm -hmm. The North was in favor of uh, protectionism, and people like Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was uh, representing the Southern landlord interest, argued that, that this uh, Hamilton is a crazy guy. Yeah? I mean, why should we subsidize these inefficient Yankee manufacturers yeah. when we can import nice things from Europe, which are not only better, but also cheaper? Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so that... Uh, a lot of developing countries have uh, their own elite uh, who don't elite. want uh, industrialization and economic development. Yeah? So you would say these elite kind of prevent countries from actually joining with their own consent the global economy or, or keeping out of it? Yeah, I mean, that, that it's a complex uh, story because uh, not all elite uh, think alike. You know, in the mm -hmm. United States, uh, there were these uh, two uh, conflicting blocks, yeah? Yeah, yeah? Which had, uh, eventually had to fight a war, the American Civil War, to decide where the country was going, yeah? Mm -hmm. So in a lot of developing countries uh, too, you know, you have uh, different types of uh, elite wanting different things, you know. The fact that you are from the landlord class doesn't necessarily mean that you are in favor of landlord class. I mean, there were some, uh, the, the, you know, Otto von Bismarck, yeah? Mm -hmm. He was from the landlord class, but uh, he also he promoted... The social uh, welfare. Yeah. That's right, yeah. That, that promoted social welfare and that, that developed uh, that, that heavy industry. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it's that, a very straightforward story, but... Yes, I mean, that, that, that the thing is that uh, since the 1980s, the global environment has been restructured in such a way that mm -hmm. the elite that uh, don't want uh, independent development could uh, be more persuasive, yeah? Mm -hmm. So that they could say, look, I mean, there are all these uh, international arrangements which make uh, protectionist policies very difficult. Mm -hmm. Why should we do it, yeah? And then th that th sounds th a lot more persuasive when the global environment is like that, yeah? Well, yes, as you mentioned uh, in an interview for uh, Democracy Now! in 2010, you said certain developing countries actually don't want uh, financial flows into their countries because it creates this speculative financial environment. Um, would you say that these developing countries have kind of shown their sovereignty in the face of, of globalization? successfully? Yeah, I mean, the countries have uh, tried, you know, the, I mean, uh, in this way I'm vastly exaggerating, but, uh, you know, developing country policymakers are not stupid, yeah? Mm -hmm. So the policymakers are from, say, poor countries. They know that if uh, they open their financial market that uh, some Wall Street fund can eat them for lunch uh, tomorrow, yeah? So they uh, don't do that, yeah? Mm -hmm. However, that, that as you grow richer, 
it become middle income. There's a lot of international pressure to, uh, to open up, but you know, different countries have uh, reacted uh, in different ways. So for example, Colombia uh, the in the early 1990s, together with Chile, introduced this uh, the rule to restrict uh, inflow of short-term capital. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the uh, regime they used, uh, I, I know more about the Chilean one than the Colombian one, but, but I think uh, they are uh, similar. I mean, basically the rule was money comes in, fine. I mean, we welcome you, but if you go out uh, within a year, you have to uh, 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 keep 30% uh, in the country. Yeah? So this is uh, known as the deposit system. So countries like uh, Colombia and Chile have uh, used this uh, to restrict uh, the short-term financial flows, which can be destabilizing while not discouraging foreign capital in general. Yeah? Yeah. So you can do a lot of different things. Yeah? So have the, the sort of power of public, global public institutions such as the IMF, which often kind of enforce these regulations on them, have, have they declined? Uh, in relative terms, yes, and also they have changed uh, a bit, you know. Uh, basically in the 80s and 90s, uh, the World Bank and the IMF, uh, they were extremely powerful mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of countries had uh, debt crisis and, you know, uh, basically they couldn't get any foreign exchange. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the only way to get this money was uh, from the IMF and the World Bank and, yeah, basically they dictated how these countries are run. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, the, the today, yeah, some countries are still in the, that kind of situation, but not many of them are. But and has the IMF changed their Exactly, view? yeah. The, the, the IMF and the World Bank themselves have uh, the, the changed a bit. I mean, especially the IMF, uh, you know, the, the until about 2003, three, four, the IMF's uh, ultimate goal was to open capital market in all developing <laughs> countries. Yeah? Since about 2005, they have uh, given up on that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. They, they actually explicitly said that actually open capital market is a bad idea for poor countries. Yeah? Maybe for middle income the countries. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, so th the IMF has uh, become uh, more reasonable. The World Bank, yeah, has become a bit more reasonable, but it's in the total kind of intellectual disarray. So uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what uh, it wants anymore. Uh, but, you know, yeah, compared to the 80s and 90s, you know, no, because uh, in the 80s and 90s, I mean, the, the young people don't know this, but, I mean, they... There was a Washington consensus. Yeah, exactly, just uh, one recipe that they gave to everyone, yeah? No, so, it, uh, I mean, uh, this is uh, the, the probably an urban legend, but uh, you uh, hear stories like some IMF economists giving a presentation in front of the Bolivian president, and oops, uh, in page 37, he forgot to change the name of the country from Colombia to Bolivia. Yeah? <laughs> so the same recipe, different numbers, different country name, you know, probably this was uh, not yeah. true, but uh, you know, <laughs> they were very narrow-minded and hard-line. Yeah. They are not like that anymore, but mm -hmm. also their power has uh, in relative terms declined because mm -hmm. of the rise of China and uh, other countries uh, which have uh, formed this uh, alternative financial institution. Mm -hmm. So in the old days, uh, there was just one bank in town, yeah? the World Bank. Yeah? If you don't like it, you don't get money. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But now there's uh, Asian Infrastructural Bank, Banco do Sul in Latin America. Mm -hmm. you know, of course, uh, compared to the uh, IMF and the World Bank, uh, they are still not as influential, as big, but you know, th at least uh, now there are uh, two, three different They're banks. Yeah? Yeah, there's yeah. some competition. Yeah? So uh, to discuss the overall effects of globalization, uh, I think they've been quite famously summarized, and I'm sure you have seen it, by Branko Milanovic, Elephant Graph, which shows that the biggest winners of, globaliz of globalization have been the so-called rising middle class in the emerging world and the 1% mm -hmm. in, well, just across the world. Uh, if this is true, on why should countries, or like Ecuador, uh, Rafael Correa's uh, country, uh, how can they complain about a globalization that seems to have benefited them? Uh, I don't think it uh, really applies to Latin America. No, because that, uh, you know, people who are in favor of uh, globalization and neoliberalism will keep repeating that thanks to our policies, the world is richer than ever. Yeah, yeah this is trivially true because uh, unless that uh, your economy is uh, growing uh, more slowly than your population, you will be richer than ever. Yeah? The real question is, whether you could have been even richer. Yeah, and the you think world they would have. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. world economy was at, uh, growing during the golden age at about 2.7, uh, 2.8%. Mm -hmm. 
since the 1980s, uh, this is in per capita terms, si since the 1980s, it has been growing at 1.3, 1.4, half the rate. Yeah? Latin America, you know, you exactly, go to Latin yeah. America, a lot of people uh, talk about the bad old days of import substitution. You know, in the 1960s and 70s, per capita income in Latin America that, uh, was growing at 3.1%. Since the 1980s, it has been growing at one quarter the rate, yeah, 0.8 percent. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not saying that you could have just uh, uh, kept uh, repeating policies of 1960 for the next 70 years and everything would have been fine. But you have to really seriously ask uh, whether this uh, policy is uh, the best you could have got. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, I mean, uh, there's a serious problem if you are uh, growing at one quarter the rate that uh, you used to grow. Yeah? Of course. Well, I think now it's a, it's a good time to move to the audience to see if there's any question. Sure. Uh, so anyone with any question? Uh, we actually have uh, a question from the live stream. Oh, OK. So uh, I'll read it out. Dear Mr. Chang, I understand your point of having to protect high value industries in its infancy that mm -hmm. are uncompetitive. In your book, you frequently mention your native South Korea as an example of progress that can be made through policies along this line. As you mentioned, South Korea has experienced rapid growth throughout developing its electronics industries. I'm wondering how, according to you, do you select the industries that are of strategic importance to develop the economy? With regard to the example of South Korea, it chose to focus on electronics, although it did not have any notable um, competencies in this mm -hmm. industry. Thanks in advance and kind regards. Yeah, no, no thank you. No, no, I mean, that's that. Uh, 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 the question that uh, gets asked a lot, I mean, how do you choose, yeah? Well, at one level, you know, it's, I mean, the, the, unless you are a frontier economy like the Netherlands, you know, for a developing country, that is uh, not so difficult, yeah? Because basically, you have no ability to invent your own new industry, yeah? You have to copy other people, yeah? So what are the main industries that, uh, that uh, rich countries have, you know, they are, well, I mean, at least what that, that, that when Korea is developing, steel, automobile, yeah, petrochemical, electronics, no brainer. Yeah? However, that uh, electronics was uh, an interesting uh, that story because that uh, Korea got into electronics at that in the beginning as the worst uh, kind of uh, assembler of uh, cheap uh, radios and so on. That Korea got into electronics. Uh, before a lot of uh, European countries, and uh, 30 years later, when the country accumulated all these uh, 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 capabilities of uh, its own, it could actually yeah, beat uh, 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 Philips, yeah, beat Siemens. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that was a uh, 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 very inspiring choice. Uh, so the lesson there on that point is that uh, when this uh, technological paradigm shift that's a very good opportunity for developing countries to get into new industries and climb, the, climb up the ladder quickly. Eh? Mm -hmm. And uh, today, that kind of shift is happening again. So already China is ahead of South Korea in terms of solar panel, yeah, for example. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you could uh, uh, actually, uh, this is a very good uh, opportunity to do this. But uh, more broadly, my view is that you know, countries become good at something only because uh, that they decide to become good at something. Yeah? No, seriously, I mean, uh, can you think of any reason why the Japanese should be good at making cars? You know, Americans, you can understand, you know, they have a lot of land, they have to go from A to B quickly. Yeah? In Japan, for God's sake, I mean, they don't even have the enough land to drive around. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So why? Yeah? No, it's only because uh, in the 1950s, the Japanese said, we want to be good at uh, making cars. Yeah? Same with Korea. I mean, we have even less uh, land than the, the, uh, Japan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a higher population density than the Japan. So, you know, it's only because we decided to become good at making cars that we are good at making cars. Yeah. So, in the end, I mean, the, the, you know, apart from a few obvious things like, you know, yes, that, that you produce oil, you, yeah, uh, specialize in petrochemical, yeah. Apart from a few of those things, I mean, there's no natural linkage with uh, your kind of uh, basic conditions and uh, what you could do. Yeah? I mean, uh, why are the Netherlands uh, good at yeah, agriculture? Yeah? No, that's the last thing that uh, you think uh, this country is good at. Yeah? 
No, I mean that uh, maybe some of you know, that some of you don't. That, that you know that, that this country is at the well, depending on the year, second or the third largest exporter of agriculture. Yeah? Agriculture needs land, and land is the last thing that uh, you have. Yeah, so you develop an agriculture that doesn't need land. Yeah, you have developed aquaponic agriculture. Yeah? So, you know, your country is a beautiful example of how actually you become good at something because you decide to good at that, that decide to become good at something. Yeah? Well, Professor Chang, in your answer, you mentioned China, and of course, in a discussion about globalization, the importance of China cannot be understated, uh, as we're seeing the gradual decline of the Washington consensus. Um, do you see this being replaced by a so-called Beijing consensus? Well, frankly, I don't know what the Beijing consensus <laughs> is, uh, but, you know. No. But do you think they will develop one? Uh, maybe, maybe not, yeah. How would it look like? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the, the, the well, but uh, let's uh, put this into perspective. Of course, uh, what China has achieved is remarkable. Yeah? Mm -hmm. In 1978, the Chinese economy uh, accounted for less than 1.5% of the world economy. Yeah? It does nothing. Yeah? Today, it accounts for 15% of the world economy. Yeah? And it will grow. Yeah? You know, that, that from one of the poorest countries in the world, now it's at a very solid uh, middle-income country with about $7,000 per capita income. But on the other hand, you have to realize that this is still a poor country. Yeah? The, Chin the Chinese economy is big because it's got so many people. Mm -hmm. But in per capita terms, it's at that, uh, you know, poorer than Colombia, poorer than Mexico, you know, yeah. poorer than Turkey, you know. Okay, I mean, that sooner or later it will catch up, but, you know, it's uh, still not uh, such a developed country. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And certainly it doesn't have the kind of uh, the, uh, intellectual the capability to challenge this uh, Anglo-American dominance. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So what they are doing is uh, to make this uh, very pragmatic adjustment mm -hmm. that uh, they see as necessary for their country's uh, future. And yeah, maybe that, that 30, 40 years later, it will have enough uh, that, that experience and enough uh, intellectual confidence to yeah. come up with an alternative development framework, but uh, I don't uh, see it at this moment. Mm -hmm. And so you said that they are kind of borrowing from these Western notions of, uh, of, of expansion. And, and do you believe that there is a kind of underlying value structure to a Chinese-led globalization? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think there are good things and bad things about uh, the Chinese uh, the, the kind of perspective. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the good thing is uh, that it's uh, very pragmatic. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it doesn't have the, if you like, uh, messiah complex as the Americans or the Europeans do. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't go around telling people you have to run your country like this. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Even if uh, they lend you money, they will you know, as far as uh, you, you don't have a diplomatic relationship with Taiwan, I mean, they'll be okay, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, that's very petty in my view, you know. Mm -hmm. But, so the, the, that's the good part of it, but the, the, I mean, the bad part of it is that, the, you know, uh, first of all, it has uh, not controlled the uh, rising inequality. Yeah? Mm -hmm. No, seriously, I mean, it was uh, one of the most equal countries in the world uh, in the late 1970s, now it's uh, inequality is not quite, but approaching the Latin American level. Yeah? Mm -hmm. In Latin America, you could say that uh, the people have lived with it uh, for the last 500 years, uh, so they have developed some kind of immunity to it. But <laughs> in China, you know, this country is uh, officially socialist. Yeah? So how are you going to that, uh, explain to that, uh, that your children that, yeah, we are a socialist country, where there's uh, this man who lives in an exact replica of the White House, while the millions of people are sleeping on the street. Yeah? I think uh, that's a serious uh, problem. Yeah? And also because of this uh, communist legacy, that even though you are a capitalist economy in effect, uh, that you pretended that you are communist and then that is used to justify lack of democracy. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that will be another mm -hmm. uh, problem. Yeah? But yes, I mean, uh, I think uh, Chinese pragmatism is that, uh, something that uh, you have to give uh, credit to. Mm -hmm.
well, you said they're pragmatic, but don't you also feel that um, it, there's a threat to this, that a undemocratic uh, state ruled by a one-party elite expanding to so many markets across the world, especially Africa, don't you think that there is uh, something kind of wrong with this? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, at least uh, until now, I mean, they are not trying to impose their values on other countries. Yeah? That's what I meant by being pragmatic, yeah? because, mm -hmm. you know, especially Americans, but uh, Westerners in general have uh, such kind of belief and confidence in the sanctity of private property and uh, that mm -hmm. this and that. Uh, of course, that uh, in practice, that uh, you know, this is not always that uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, observed. But uh, you know, so that they try to preach to other people. Look, I mean, that uh, you have to introduce this, introduce but that. You know? Wouldn't you say that even though they preach, for example, through neoliberalism, it mm -hmm. was still, in a way, and I think you've talked about this, it still has a value. Like, for example, there was uh, one of the myths of neoliberalism was that through free markets, we will it would lead to a democracy, but. A Chinese-led globalization doesn't even doesn't seem to even have that. So wouldn't you say then it's it's very dangerous as it is right now, uh, with G. P. Well, claiming mean, uh, the, 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 the no, I mean that, that that this is uh, quite complicated. But uh, you know that I'm a Democrat. Yeah, I mean I lived the first 24 years of my life under military dictatorship, and I don't want for one second advocate the, the lack of democracy. I don't. Yeah. I mean, if but, uh, some people think, uh, you know, uh, yeah. the democracy is uh, so, the, a luxury, I, I think uh, they should uh, the, the really rethink that. You know, the people advocate that the, the dictators are only because uh, they haven't lived under one. Yeah? So, but, you know, the, having said that, I mean, wha what I was trying to say was that the Chinese are not at least uh, going to other countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Saying that actually not having democracy, having one party rule is a good thing. Yeah? They don't force their beliefs. That's right. Yeah. So uh, un, uh, you know, unlike mm -hmm. you know Americans who would invade another country to set up a democracy. Yeah? So mm -hmm. that that uh, in that sense is uh, less kind of uh, the toxic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, the, of course, uh, the, the other side of this uh, the, is that uh, you know the so-called. Western values and so on, you know, that they are not yeah, really yeah, uh, kind of strongly defended. You know, when the Americans uh, needed it, they just that uh, yeah, rename torture as uh, enhanced interrogation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that you know, <laughs> I mean, that's that uh, totally hypocritical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you look at uh, how these people actually behave, I mean, you can pick a lot of faults, uh, despite that they go to other countries and say, yeah, you have to follow these values, and then, you know, the, the, the if I was some dictator in another country, I would say, well, you guys don't uh, the observe it, so who are you to tell me that, uh, how to run my country? So I want to now move on from global or, uh, governance with China or either US. You don't seem to believe China has the intellectual capacity or is even willing. But there's, of course, those emerging countries that are not looking to become global leaders, mm -hmm. uh, Latin American countries, for example. And according to Danny Roderick, uh, in a paper I think he wrote in 2015, he argued that these countries, not only th Latin America, but most emerging countries are experiencing uh, premature deindustrialization. Mm -hmm. So they're going from manufacturing countries to service e economies at a level of income that, for example, the, le the, left, the, the, the West was not at. Uh, what do you say? Wh what do you think of this development? W would it then uh, make the infant industry promotion uh, policies ineffective, or, or yeah. would it be a solution to it? No, actually, it, uh, it's uh, quite sad that this uh, phenomenon of uh, premature deindustrialization got uh, mainstream attention only when Danny Roderick uh, wrote that paper because uh, the UNCTA, the, the United Nations uh, Conference on Trade and Development which represents uh, the, the develop developing country view on economic matters in the UN. I mean, they, they were talking about premature deindustrialization already in the Before. 1990s. You know, my colleague in the University of Cambridge, uh, uh, the Chilean economist Gabriel Palma, uh, wrote a series of papers that, 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 uh, from 2010 that to you know, provide the statistical evidence for it. Yes, I mean, that, that a lot of developing, you know, when you're at that, that, that rich, mature economy, it is, I mean, that, that usually okay, although 
it's not in cases like uh, Britain, I mean, I can explain on this uh, now, but it's uh, usually okay to see the share of industry declining, uh, because that, that basically because that, that your industry is, it looks like it's uh, declining because it's uh, becoming so m much more efficient that uh, the prices of industrial goods are falling. Just think about the fact that uh, 15 years ago, with the money that uh, you'd uh, be able to buy, I don't know, four computers, you could buy only one, yeah? whereas uh, the price of haircut was uh, more or less the same. Yeah? So anyway, so that uh, the industrialization in the developed countries is uh, that, uh, usually okay, but you know, in developing countries, I mean, many countries have uh, that, that started seeing the decline of industry even before they actually fully industrialize. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and the, the scale is uh, the shocking. Yeah? That uh, Brazil, which uh, used to be like the most uh, industrialized developing country in the 1980s, even more than uh, uh, South Korea, you know, their the manufacturing sector used to account for something like uh, 28 to 30 percent of uh, GDP in the late 1980s. Now it's 10 uh, percent and falling. Yeah? How can we reverse this? Well, you need uh, a lot of uh, the government policy to reverse it, yeah? because that. Uh, well, yeah. Or should we embrace it? For example, uh, uh, I think Danny Roderick argues that for Latin America, it's way too late. Uh, so should these countries then embrace service uh, industry, or how? Yeah, but uh, w what are these services? You know, I mean, that, that unfortunately, the, you know, Brazil is not going to to be the next uh, powerhouse of investment banking and management <laughs> consulting. Yeah? So services in developing countries basically means, you know, housemaids, yeah? yeah. I mean, people selling uh, little things on the street, you know, that, that uh, little boys that are wiping your windscreen at the, the junction, yeah? So, you know, at one level, why should you care how people make living, yeah? As far as they make uh, enough money, unfortunately, in the long run, if you begin to you know, abandon manufacturing industry and begin to specialize in producing soybeans and the, the, the hiring more housemates, uh, your long-term uh, productivity is uh, going to fall. Yeah? Another key uh, effect of this rapid industrialization is the fact that, at least in the West, the industrial class, the manufacturing class, was the one that led to labor rights and uh, yep. social uh, safety nets mm -hmm. and social welfare. And in particular in countries that don't have that, uh, for example, a proper one in Africa. Yeah. And these countries are also deindustrializing really quickly. Who would lead the movement towards labor rights? Or who exactly. do you think No, no, you are very right. I mean, that, uh, you know, that actually there's a very strong link uh, between industrialization, the rise of working class movement, and democracy. Eh? Mm -hmm. So that is how you know, the, the, the Western the world uh, and, and countries like Korea have evolved. Yeah? Now, without the yeah, organized working class, it's uh, going to be very difficult to uh, kind of, uh, improve uh, labor rights and uh, human rights in general. So, so, so yes, I mean, it uh, has uh, this, uh, the industrial legend has not just economic implication, but also the very serious uh, political implication. So uh, the solution would be more government intervention, for in infant industry promotion, or, or what exactly? Yeah, I mean, infant industry protection uh, is a very broad yeah. idea. So the exactly how you do it, you know, you could do it with yeah, in the classical manner the, with the, the tariffs and the trade protection. But you know, uh, the, the countries have also done it uh, with the subsidies and you know the the, the government uh, support for research and development and uh, many other means. Yeah, labor training. So yes, I mean, the, but the, the the point is that. You know that there has to be an industrial class. Yeah, public uh, policy intervention to create an industrial class uh, who can actually yeah the take uh, the economy forward. Yeah, no, that that you know maybe it doesn't look uh, that, that 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 different that, that uh, if you are in a country like the Netherlands, but uh, even in the rich countries, the manufacturing sector is uh, the key to technological development. Yeah? I don't know about the, the Wh Dutch uh, statistics, but in the US, in the UK, manufacturing sector today account for only 10% of output. Huh? Mm -hmm. But 60, 70% of research and development is done in manufacturing. Huh? Mm -hmm. So that's where new technologies are, uh, emerge. Huh? Yeah. So
So if you lose that sector, your ability to increase productivity will fall. Mm -hmm. And it's not, uh, not uh, the rocket science. Yeah? Okay. And is this also the formula to combat absolute poverty, which you know still exists heavily, in, even though it has declined considerably um, since the 1970s? Um, do you believe uh, we should combat absolute poverty in this way as well by promoting? Oh yeah, no, no. I think uh, it's the most uh, effective way to the promote, uh, uh, sorry, to uh, reduce poverty. Yeah? Mm -hmm. No, because that uh, you know some countries, uh, especially in Latin America, uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, on the the so-called pink wave, uh, have uh, reduced the uh, poverty and inequality a lot by introducing government uh, the spending uh, schemes like uh, conditional cash transfer, Bolsa Familia in the, the, the Brazil, the Oportunidades in uh, the Mexico, the Familia in Acción in Colombia. But you know these are increases in income, reductions in poverty that can be eliminated with a stroke of a pen. Yeah? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the government can say, well, we can afford this, so we are going to cut the Bolsa Familia by 40%, yeah, or something like that, which has been done. So, yes, the uh, uh, poverty is uh, going to increase. Yeah? But if you invest, uh, uh, develop new industries, create new jobs, of course, I mean, some of these can be closed down and so on. But in general, no one can come and say, okay, we are going to shut down all the factories because we don't like these people. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's actually the, the, the most secure way of uh, that, uh, reducing poverty and increasing uh, people's living standards. Yeah? But should the onus of this be just on the state? Is there no place for market mechanisms to also oh reduce no, no, poverty? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, uh, it, uh, you know, we know that uh, this uh, that, that, uh, you know, the totally socialized economy like the Soviet Union doesn't work. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You need both market and the government. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And there are things that uh, markets are usually better at there are things that, that uh, governments are usually better at and uh, they have to work together. Yeah? Mm -hmm. No, uh, let me give you an uh, interesting example. Uh, take the case of Singapore. Yeah? When you read about Singapore in the financial newspapers or in standard uh, economics books, you will only hear about uh, its uh, free trade policy and its welcoming attitude towards uh, foreign investors, which it has, but you will never be told that 90% of land in Singapore is owned by the government. 85% of housing is provided by government-owned housing corporation, and a staggering 22% of GDP is produced by state-owned enterprises, including the famous Singapore Airlines. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the key is a mix between market mechanisms. Yeah, exactly, and and, and uh, there is no one single mix. Yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. oh. yeah so that that uh, compare say Singapore with South Korea, you know, South Korea relies a lot more on domestically owned uh, the enterprises like Samsung and LG and Hyundai yeah? mm -hmm. uh, is that, uh, much less willing to the accept uh, foreign investment than Singapore. On the other hand, yeah, it's, uh, so in that sense, it's uh, more, say, to the left. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it's uh, much more reluctant to use uh, state-owned enterprises than Singapore is. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's uh, more to the right. Yeah? So there's no single mixer that uh, works everywhere. And uh, that if you look at uh, the experiences of uh, successful economies in the last uh, two, three centuries, you find that countries had very unusual uh, combinations. You know, th this country, you know, that th you had that uh, uh, free trade, but that, uh, well, I mean, theoretically it's more consistent, but that didn't protect uh, the intellectual property. Yeah? You, know, you try to sell this that, that to free market economies today, they'll freak out. Yeah? No, 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 we need patterns, otherwise there'll be no new drugs. You know? That's their standard line. So how come you have you know, all these uh, famous companies with uh, high technologies if uh, that, uh, you know, the intellectual property values are uh, so important? Yeah? Mm -hmm. you know, th there are other countries uh, which uh, that, that, uh, use uh, completely different models. Yeah? So, I mean, so basically what I... I'm uh, pleading you to the, the find out is how there's such a dif uh, the, such a, the, the different ways of uh, succeeding. Yeah? I mean, there's no single formula other than this very general principle that when you are economically less developed, you need to do things to promote the higher uh, productivity industries. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you know exactly how you achieve it, what combination of policies. I mean, that, that, there's a huge diversity. Yeah? So we've discussed about ideologies, neoliberalism, and policies uh, in general uh, that lead to development, almost as if there is this 
uh, almost as if development is deterministic in nature. But do you believe that there are greater things uh, like culture, like geography, that simply doom some countries to underdevelopment? Well, I do not uh, believe in that because, uh, you know, it's the uh, same with uh, individuals. You know, when you see someone who have succeeded, you think, oh, yeah, that guy was destined to succeed. You know, he was born in a good family or he had a uh, high IQ or whatever. But when you actually th th look at their th stories, I mean, th maybe not always, but almost always, they also have th problems, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, th you know, th people talk about resource curse, yeah? So Latin American countries, African countries have too much resource. That's why they are not developing. Yeah? But actually, if you look at the objective measure of uh, resource endowments, countries like the US, Australia, and Canada are much better endowed with uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, these uh, resources with a possible exception of uh, South Africa. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah, so how did uh, those countries develop? Yeah? Mm -hmm. you know, the people talk about the, the, you know, the kind of uh, Bad geography, yeah. You know, so that uh, for example, people say, "Oh, being landlocked is that uh, really bad." Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you then explain that uh, the two of the richest uh, the countries in the world, Switzerland and Austria, are landlocked? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that uh, the best performing post-Soviet republic, okay. Uzbekistan, is the only country in the world which is double landlock, yeah? You have to go through two countries to get to the sea, yeah? You know, people talk about malaria, but, you know, Italy, South Korea, the, the United States, uh, they all had malaria, yeah? You know, Singapore is that the right, I mean, bang on the, the, the equator, yeah? Mm -hmm. How come uh, they didn't suffer from tropical weather, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, the basically the, the, the point is that, you know, these things uh, look like a burden that, 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 that is holding these countries back, but the point is that they look like a burden only because these countries are underdeveloped. Yeah? Mm -hmm. G let me give you another example. You know, the, that famous earthquake in Haiti in 2010 that killed uh, 200,000 people, maybe 300,000 in a country with, what, 10 million people? That was only Richter scale seven. I mean, that kind of earthquake happens in Japan every other day. Yeah? And maybe one grandmother dies, yeah, because that, that she was a bit too slow to evacuate. Yeah? So how come in one country, the same strength of an earthquake can kill one person, in another, it can kill 200,000? Yeah? It's not because the earthquake is somehow more benign in Japan. It's because uh, Japan has a uh, technology, money, and organization. Yeah? So a lot of uh, things that you think are the causes of underdevelopment are actually the symptoms. Well, I mean, the inability to do deal with them is the symptom, uh, not not you know the being on the equator or whatever. Yeah, yeah and also that uh, you know that that line of thinking is uh, very unhelpful because uh, then what is the you know the policy implication? Yeah, should uh, Colombia invade the Netherlands? Yeah, to move away from the equator? Yeah. Should you try to invent a time machine to, you know, change your history? No, I mean, that, that even if uh, that they are the most important causes, which I don't believe uh, they are, mm -hmm. it's uh, actually a pointless exercise, yeah? Yeah. because you cannot change them. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You have to think that, 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 okay, I mean, maybe those things are not helping us, but can we do something to change this? Yeah? So it's more about institutions and political development. Exactly, yeah. Um, on that note, maybe uh, it's a good time to go to another audience question. Two. Uh, maybe two, yeah. Um, yes, over there. Gentlemen over there. I in blue shirt. Can you raise your hand again, please, sir? Hi. Uh, <laughs> I, I noted what you said before, like way at the beginning, that you said that necessity was a choice, you said, and I thought it was pretty interesting. And I want to know if you mean that it's a choice in the sense that governments are capable but unwilling to do whatever the necessities are for the people, mm -hmm. or if the answer lies somewhere else, and what, what you think the answer might be. And if it is the government, then like, what are the barriers to go through with actually fulfilling those needs? I see. <laughs> okay. So shall we take both? Yeah, uh, let's take another yeah. question. And uh, can you keep on? Yeah, yeah, no. 
<laughs> well, I'm getting old, but my memory is not that bad yet. Yeah. about the IMF and the United Nations and stuff like that. Uh, the development sector, is it generally dying in terms of creating jobs? Like for example, an internship at the UN, is it still relevant today as it would have been like 10, 15 years ago maybe? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, on the first one, the, no, the, you are basically the, the raising issues with this, uh, yeah, I would say it's uh, one of the most uh, fundamental questions in the social sciences, uh, the uh, question as to whether it is uh, the structure or the human agency that is more important. Mm? And the sh short, easier answer is that they are both important. Yeah? But that, uh, you know, that people tend to think uh, to the extreme. So some people think, you know, I say that uh, take the case of South Korea again. I mean, because it's uh, the example that I know the best. I mean, uh, they say, oh, the, you know, South Korea was destined to develop because uh, Japanese colonialism and the Second World War, you know, the, uh, made society very flat and therefore raised uh, returns to human capital. You know, it destroyed the, the landlord class, and then there was also the land reform, and there was the American that. Uh, uh, aid uh, because it was uh, in a strategic position in the Cold War and so on. Yes, uh, all of that is true. On the other hand, if that is the case, how was it not developing in the 1950s? Eh? The short answer is that we had the wrong president. Eh? No, this was a guy who was a member of, uh, minor member of the former royal family. He went to Princeton as a the, the undergraduate student when most Koreans didn't even know that there's a country called the United States of America. He married an aristocratic uh, the Austrian lady, and uh, to fit that, he was uh, really our Marie Antoinette. Hmm? Because that, that, uh, you know, one time, his agriculture minister that, that told him, sir, we have a serious uh, rice shortage in this country, and we need to do something about that, and he blotted out, that's the problem with the bloody Koreans. All they want to eat is rice, you know? Why don't they eat beef, you know? Why don't they eat the uh, wheat? Well, sir, we don't produce those things, you know. Yeah, so uh, when you have a president like that, that whatever you do, that, 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 uh, whatever you have in terms of uh, the structure, it's not going to happen, yeah? On the other hand, you don't want to reduce this to another version of uh, Disney movies, yeah? Where you can achieve anything if you believed in yourself, yeah? Yeah, so you need to uh, strike a uh, delicate balance. No, actually, that uh, you know that's uh, that quite an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? Because the lib neoliberals, liberals, uh, that they try to tell you that you can achieve anything as an individual if you work hard. Yeah, but if you're a country, forget about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you're only Colombia. You are only Burkina Faso. Yeah. How do you think uh, that you can become like uh, the United States or the Netherlands? Yeah. No, this is very curious, actually. Anyway, but uh, <laughs> going back to your question, yes, uh, so that, you know, this is that, that what makes uh, generalization very difficult, yeah? because that in each case, you have a particular historical juncture, yeah? particular legacies, particular individuals playing certain roles, and yeah, sometimes it clicks and uh, works, sometimes it doesn't, but, you know, if I have to choose, you know, I think that, that, that we need to pay more attention to agency. Yeah? Because that, that these uh, structural explanations are too easy, if you like. Yeah? Because that you can always find some structural reason. Yeah? Oh, they had the wrong history. Why did the Spaniards, instead of the English, that, that colonize you? Yeah? I mean, that why did your that, that, uh, ancestors that, uh, decide to settle that, that where it is really hot? Yeah? I mean, they should have uh, moved away from the equator. Yeah? So I think uh, that uh, it's that, uh, very important to recognize the importance of both structure and agency. But you know, uh, that, that I think in general that, that, that we have to pay more attention to the question of human agency. Yeah? Because as I keep saying, I mean that, that you know, countries become good at things because they decide to become good at those things, yeah? not because you are destined to be good at that. Yeah? No, seriously, I mean, that, 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 the Dutch agriculture, you know, 
Japanese cars, you know, these are the examples showing that, that the structures that are, of course, constraining, but not the, the uh, dominant. Yeah? As for the relevance of uh, the UN and so on, yeah, I mean, it's uh, been a long kind of uh, the decline. I think that the UN, I mean, has been constantly kind of undermined uh, basically by the United States. Uh, the so, you know, for example, especially in the terms of economic matters, uh, the, since the 1980s, the American line has been that economics is what the World Bank and the IMF do, UN does uh, humanitarian work and uh, social policy. Yeah? And this is a completely false because uh, you cannot separate these things like that. Yeah? But unfortunately, there has been their line, so the, for example, UNCTAD, which uh, the, the started uh, out of the non-aligned movement uh, in the 1960s and had been a strong advocate of uh, developing country interest uh, in the uh, matters of uh, trade uh, and international investment in the, the UN system. You know, now, I mean, it's been basically that pushed into basically working on how to make your customs procedure more efficient. Yeah? Trade facilitation is the word. Mm -hmm. Because that uh, whenever they try to say something about substance of trade policy, the Americans come and say, no, you cannot talk about the substance, yeah? You are just implementing this, yeah? So that, that talk about how to make uh, customs procedure more efficient. Yeah? So that's uh, the sad truth. Yeah? Uh, what about the, the World Bank and the IMF? I imagine working for them in the 90s and 80s meant that you have to follow a certain, you have to believe in certain prescriptions of neoliberalism and well, of, of economics in general. Would you say that's still happening, for example, in the World Bank? Well, you know, the, you have to realize that uh, these are political organizations, yeah? Mm -hmm. They are not kind of, you know, the a university academic yeah, department. So, I mean, uh, basically, if you want to stay there, you have to follow the party line, so to speak. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you don't follow the party line, you will never get promoted. They may not kick you out, but I know quite a few people who are at a relatively junior position despite being relatively old and mm -hmm. so on because of their political views. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I mean, that they also have uh, that. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, very complex uh, structure. So the research department in the IMF uh, recently have produced a lot of very kind of uh, critical output, but whether that is necessarily translated into the guy who's running the IMF mission in Guinea-Bissau, yeah. that's another question. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So uh, to end the, the interview, uh, we started the interview by discussing your own childhood growing up in a then a developing country, and you talked about how you saw living standards increase with your own eyes. Uh, I myself have uh, been li I lived in se several developing countries. So I would like to know now, with globalization in place, how do you perceive uh, the future of young people like myself uh, living in a, a more interconnected world in which traditional social ties and 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 traditions are being destroyed in a way or dismantled mm. uh, for the sake of the market? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's a complex uh, issue because, uh, you know, I agree that the uh, market has uh, the, this uh, liberating uh, quality yeah? mm -hmm. because it's anonymous, uh, you don't have to be you know, tied into any network and, you know, you can just, you know, that, uh, be yourself, yeah? Yeah, so that, for example, that, that once again, going back to my childhood, you know, when I was a kid, you know, a lot of, uh, the, well, most of the middle class families in the, the South Korea had like a couple of maids, yeah, because uh, the, there were a lot of poor families in the rural areas who were very glad to get rid of uh, the, their you know, unwanted daughters, yeah. So the, there were a lot of these maids, and I mean, the, the, when they came to the city, a lot of them would first uh, work as maids, but then they would move to factory jobs. Yeah? And, you know, respectable middle class 
people like my parents uh, couldn't really understand why they would do that, yeah? Because, uh, you know, it's hard work. I mean, in those days, uh, the, the typical working hours in the Korean factories were like uh, the 12, 13, 14 hours a day, yeah? Very dangerous, unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So why would they not live in, yeah, this safe middle-class family and yeah, okay, may, maybe they don't have the same cash, yeah, disposal, but other than that, you know, it's uh, a lot safer, yeah, but these girls basically wanted uh, personal freedom, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so market has this uh, liberating quality, which is uh, very attractive, but this, of course, uh, is bought at the cost of severing ties with, yeah, your community, your social support network, yeah, so yes, I mean it, uh, 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 it's a very uh, dangerous uh, 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 venture, and this is why we need to build uh, the welfare system. Yeah, mm -hmm. because that uh, yeah, you know, I'm totally against that. Uh, that uh, you know, romanticizing these uh, traditional communities. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean the market may be harsh, but that uh, you may have uh, the, an uncle or the father who's even harsher. You know. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I don't uh, romanticize uh, communities, but you know, if you are going to destroy the traditional communities, then you have to build a bigger, more universalized community. Yeah? That's the welfare state. Yeah? No, because that uh, basically that uh, what the welfare state does in a country like the Netherlands is uh, to be your family. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you lose your job, you get sick, you have a kid. Yeah, you need help. Yeah, yeah, and then the, the, this. Yeah, system that will support you. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, people are driven into this uh, freedom of the market mm -hmm. without this uh, that, uh, compensating uh, the support system. Yeah. So they are cut off uh, from the community and then they join the market. They don't have the community anymore. They are subject to that, that mm -hmm. kind of, uh, the, the, the harsh discipline of the market but then they don't yet uh, have the welfare state. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I think that, that, that we really need to uh, talk about building this uh, that, uh, welfare state uh, even in developing countries. Of course, uh, you cannot expect you know, Colombia or that, 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 you know, Ghana to have the same kind of welfare state that you have in Sweden or that, uh, the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. But you know, even those countries uh, didn't start with a large welfare state. You know, the, for example, Sweden was uh, actually a very late comer to the welfare state. I mean, Sweden didn't even have income tax until 1932. Yeah? Sadly, we don't have any time sure. for more uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, I think Sam can say a couple of words for rethinking economics. Uh, to yes, uh, first of all, thanks for the interview. Uh, we are very happy to co organize this interview. Uh, tomorrow, as already said in the beginning, uh, Rethinking Economics organizes a festival, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the tickets are already uh, like sold out. Actually, it is for free, uh, so we are fully booked. Uh, but in two weeks, uh, we have a national meeting, uh, and there, if you are interested in rethinking not only globalization, but re economics in general, you can come to our meeting and discuss new ideas, things, how to really think critical about what we are being taught. Uh, so if you are interested, you can look up on our f website or on our Facebook. Uh, and besides that, we have uh, just published a website on economics education. Its name is really simple, economicseducation.org. And if you are interested in not only the ideas of Hai Jun Cheng, which uh, feature really prominently also on the website, but also many more ideas, please go to the website and see what a lot of different ideas about economics, about the economy are so uh, that you are not only in your narrow-minded uh, ideas which, which are currently being taught at uh, also at this university. So <laughs> thanks for all. <laughs>